the uh, black rock patch so we're going to be theory crafting hey welcome to Falcraft. i'm having hope you're well and good and on to Night, this episode of the Half Stone Half Hour, we're going to be chatting away and having a little bit of a think just on the surface from a new to intermediate player perspective about theory crafting, what it is, and then taking a look at Black Rock Mountain, the new cards that have come out, instead of a card by card analysis, taking a broader look and trying to have a think about how new cards affect the metagame, the kind of decks, the kind of play styles that are played, and then also how it might affect a couple of different decks. You've got a favourite hero, how might it affect your deck? So without further ado, we're going to jump on in. We've already done some videos that deal with um, card by card with very, very quick individual analysis when those cards were launched. What we're now going to do is have a little think and take a look at a wider view. We're going to take a look at class by class. We're going to have a little think as we think about each class about what that class does well at the moment, some popular decks that people will probably know if you're new to Hearthstone, we'll introduce them briefly, and also then have a little think about how these cards might change them. Will they create brand new decks? Will they cause some kind of tweaking or changing of current decks? And then finally, we'll try and take the widest view possible and with all the new cards, try and make some general thoughts, um, which may or may not be proved true, about how different decks of Hearthstone might interact with each other. So without further ado, we're going to jump into Druid cards to start with. Now, please do. We're live on twitch.tv forward slash Falcroftcast. We will take thoughts, ideas, suggestions from the chat as well. So if you're on YouTube, please do join us sometime. Or if you're on Twitch, welcome. Really good to have you with us. Okay, so... Druids, we're starting with first. We're going to go through the class cards to start with, I believe, depending on exactly um, how my windows fancies. Yep, we're going to go through things in various alphabetical order, and unless. Ooh, I'm just going to try and tweak it so that we actually do. That'll be very, very good. Um, so we're going to take a look at class cards, we're going to take a look at neutrals, and then we're going to go through other bits and bobs. So, Druid of the Flame for Druids. So, this druid produces 5-2 minion or a 2-5 minion. Now the tokens produced the transforming into a 5-2 or 2-5. It's been confirmed by the Hearthstone team that those are both beasts. So for that reason, Druid of the Flame is not awful. It's not great in a card and of itself. What it gives um, druids is potentially, depending on how you use it, two things. Could either be a card to help you survive the early game. If it's a two attack and five health minion, um, it's not awful for its mana cost of three. You could turn it into a tank. You could use it to trade stuff in the early game. It's one potential use of that two five. As a three two two, it's really no one's friend. As a five two minion, that's only marginally better than Magma Rager. So remember, Magma Rager is a five attack, one health minion. And statistically, the card, if you play it in Hearthstone, the card you're most likely to lose a game after playing. Hey, Blizzard's words, not mine. So, for one more health, is it going to stick around that much more on the table? Probably not. For those reasons, um, Druid of the Flame, it's not awful. It does produce beasts, and beasts can be, you know, of assistance in some ways or another. Uh, it could be a trigger for, of course, Druid of the Fang. That was the new Druid card that popped up in Goblins vs. Gnomes. However, in itself... 50-50. Could also be a late game target. If you can keep it alive as a 5-2, you could then throw a Savage Roar and perhaps um, Force of Nature type thing. So if you can keep it alive for one turn, then the Savage Roar will buff it from 5 attack to 7 attack. I'm loading Hearthstone in the background just so we can have a look at these cards um, if we need to to contextualise. So that's Druid of the Flame. Our other Druid option, what else have Druids got? Um, in and of themselves. Well, if we flip to next, we have Volcanic Lumberer. So Volcanic Lumberer is a bit more of a straight drop. Taunt costs one less for each minion that died this turn. Now, Volcanic Lumberer is very much a late game tank, but remember, Druids have some very powerful late game tanks and taunts at the moment. So if I jump on in, let's just pan this back. We'll shrink our screen region capture just a little. Pop it over in the uh, right column, just so we can have a look at the druid's toolbox at the moment. So if I'm a druid at this point in time, what do I have in my arsenal? I certainly have things like the very, very wonderful druid of the claw, five mana, four, six, wonderful tank. I have the power, if I really want, that is Ancient of War. That's a five attack, 
10 health tank would taunt for a mere 7 mana. And the Iron Bark Protector, which even if I don't actually have those other cards, I can go 888 and taunt, and that in itself as a basic card is really, really pretty strong. Great until you get War Engines. So where does Volcanic Lumber fit in for the Druid? One less for each minion that died this turn. If you force a Venture and Savage Roared, a fairly common, I'm just going to put up the Ramp Druid combo. So remember, Force of Nature will spawn you a wonderful um, three Triants with charge that die at the end of the turn. And then also Savage Rule, give your characters two attack this turn. So if I have to Force of Nature and I sacrifice three Triants, then I could very easily pop up and play this Volcanic Lumberer. And depending on how many opposing minions I killed, this would cost well, six mana. I could drop a cheaper tank. If I was able to kill three enemy minions and I lost my three triumphs, then that would be six minions dead, and this would only drop for three mana. So this is a trait with some other of the Black Rock Mountain cards that we'll see in a few different examples. This thing where it's a mechanic where things cost less mana for every minion that's died this turn. Now if we jump back and analyze that, it's not just your minions, it's your enemy minions too, as we just sort of showed. So these cards flourish in situations where you can sacrifice or trade minions cheaply or efficiently. So you use your minions in some way to sacrifice a bunch of them or trade a bunch of opponent stuff off the table, clear the table effectively, or kill minions somehow and then you get almost a double tempo advantage. What do I mean by that? Because you need to minions to die, it's better if they, they're your enemy's minions. So you're getting an advantage if you're killing enemy minions, presumably, or you're getting yourself back into the game. A typical example is things like killing off imps that a warlock might have spawned with implosion. Uh, a hunter who is using his unleash the hounds or her unleash the hounds to sacrifice their dogs in a bad situation and get themselves back into kind of table control. Or, if you're ahead, getting further ahead. What being able to do these cost one less for each minion that die this turn effects let you do is either regain table control after trades and then have a bit of an advantage, or if you're ahead, kill off your opponent's minions and then get more of an advantage. But only if you can kill enough minions to make the mana cost of that card actually worthwhile. So here, Volcanic Lumber is a very, very good example. Druids have better tanks. But if there is a situation you can create in Druid where you're able to trade or sacrifice minions, then you could find some kind of benefit from that. So Volcanic Lumber and our little friend that we just had a look at, Druid of the Flame. Those are the Druid tools, or the Druid additions. So Druid of the Flame, I think, is quite situational. If you take a little look, I'm just going to pan this away as well, so we can have a final little look at Druid of the Fang, which I think is the main thing that benefits from beasts in Druid. Fang Druid, if you have a beast, transform this into a 7-7. Seven seven. Well, Druid of the Flame certainly te tees up Druid of the Fang. And if you're able to ramp into it, maybe between the Flame and Fang, this is pointing at a bit more of an early pressure Druid deck. Druids, obviously known at the moment, were renowned for a little bit of ramping. Innovates, wild growths, into all of the nasty of turn 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, yada, 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 yada. Big mid to late game cards. How can I get my big cards out early and get more pressure on my opponent more early than they can achieve? Can I throw down Shades of Necks? But really turn 1 to 3, 1 to 4 with a ramp Druid, course you're using your wraths you're using your swipes you're using your keepers of the groves and all these things if you're playing an early to mid game deck that really you're just trying to stay alive with fang druid flame druid potentially looking if you were creative i think you could try and have an earlier game druid deck still with the ramp characteristics but with a druid deck that hits earlier in the early to mid game it's something that druids haven't really done hugely and if you take a look at other Druid cards that have been released. The Grove Tender, each player drawing a card, that's te generally tend to be in Mill Druids later in the game. And also things like the Anodized Robo Cub that turned up with Goblins vs. Gnomes. So it looks as though, if you take Druid of the Flame, have a look at Fang, which is in Goblins vs. Gnomes, Anodized Robo Cub, Blizzard are kind of putting together a bit more of an early game to whether or not it's going to flourish. We'll see. But you can certainly see Flame combo with Druid of the Fang. Now, you'd need to build an early to mid-game Druid deck. You'd still can 
contain things like innovate because it's just so powerful but there might be a kind of mid-range druid archetype um, several people have tried to run mid-range or tempo druids before what this gives you is potentially another run that you could go down with but the druid of the flame i'd look to combo with sudden fury protector then defender of argus um, or ways of buffing health so that my turn three five two is not just going to disappear off the table which is quite possible um, are there any ways I can protect it? Can I buff health or do I do have buffs? You can power of the wild, depending on how much money you have. But playing it as a naked turn three on its own is going to be quite vulnerable. So really you want to be able to play it with a buff. So it suddenly becomes a... But then if you play it with a buff like Mark of the Wild, you're turning that into a seven attack, four mana taunt for five. It's becoming less mana efficient the more you buff it up. Could work with a new fawn card that gives a mana crystal or card. Interesting, very interesting indeed. So, um, Umber Domo in chat is saying, What about the Grove Tender? Could work with this, give each player mana crystal, each player draws a card. You do have those other early game druid options as well. So, that's the druid two class cards. So, how does that affect, or how could it affect druid play? Well, we've discussed one of those options. If you really wanted to, you could kind of slot these perhaps purely in some kind of mid-range druid they're not really ramp druid cards you can see this ramp druid example deck list i've got on the right this is pretty tight at the moment and you will see variations around the tech harrison jones lotheb azure drake these type of things but generally speaking if you're going to be ramping you've got your big mid game there three to five mana and so forth and then of course your big finishes that you want to get into ancient of laws card health and restore if anything this is a bit more early game this is ramping but ramping into a mid game rather than ramping into huge late game options but of course there's the ace in the hole of dragons so we'll come and have a look at dragons in a bit so from a pure druid perspective druid of the flame and our new friend uh, the interesting but slightly challenging volcanic lumber druid of the flame might help in some mid-rangey druid decks you might want an earlier mid-rangey type druid if you're thinking about Volcanic Lumberer, it's how can I sacrifice things to make this worthwhile? And what situation will this come into play where it will actually really benefit me above playing one of the powerful tank options that Druid has right now? So, examples for example, maybe perhaps if you're a Druid and you're playing a Paladin with Muster for Battle, if you're playing a Druid and you're playing Hunter with Unleash the Hounds, if you hit Swipe and Swipe kills all of their 1-1 one -one minions, suddenly you can drop this for 5. A lot of these are quite niche and very situational plays. The more likely thing that's going to happen, maybe with a druid, is you're going to throw down something like a force of nature and see if you can trade some minions, or if you're going to trade your existing minions on the table for enemy minions. That's the way where you're probably going to get more like four minions dying on a turn, five minions dying on a turn. Things that make it low enough that dropping a volcanic lumber becomes a very mana efficient play. So, outside of the existing archetypes, there's room for one perhaps as a tech taunt in a very aggro heavy metagame but it'll be interesting to see how that comes together lumbering would work with poison seas since it counts all that died um, a very good point by Umbra actually if we have a look and take a look at poison seeds which I have completely lost because I've forgotten the mana cost destroy all minions, very true summon 2-2 treants to replace them an interesting, very very interesting combo indeed of course you can wipe the board and the 2 2 triumphs, you can then sacrifice all of those. You may well be able to get a free um, or certainly very, very cheap Volcanic Lumber out of that. So, Volcanic Lumber and Poison Seas is a very good shout by you there. Umbra, this is why it's so much better when everyone chats on the stream. Okay, let's have a look at Hunter next. So, Hunter get a couple of cards. They get the Core Rager and Quick Shot. Core Rager, I like. Core Rager is a pretty straightforward card. Um, 444, that's a solid minion in itself. Its mana, attack, and everything balances out beautifully. If we then have a look at the battle cry, if your hand's empty, gain 3 3. Well, at worst, you get a 444 beast. It's reasonably solid. There are other 4 drops, maybe you prefer to drop. But if you take a look at the hunter curve, and I think we should kind of have a look at specific hunter cards, this would be a very good thing to have a look at. I don't know if I've actually got a hunter deck together at the moment. Mid freeze with snake. That is a mid-range freeze deck with snake. We have a look at our hunter curve. What are we playing? Handmaster. Maybe shredders in terms of a turn four draw. So if we're trying to set up some kind of win condition, core rager not too awful. 
Um, so, Quorn Rager, if you have an empty hand, then gaining three off the back of that. When, as a hunter, you're going to have an empty hand? Well, it's possible. If you're face hunting and throwing down lots of stuff in the early game, what this can potentially let you have is a nice, really mana efficient drop. It turns Quorn Rager, of course, into a 7 7, and that makes it big game hunter territory. So when would I play it? Maybe on a turn four in sort of an early game pressury hunter type deck, if I'm really firing for the kill. What it will let me have is potentially another beast on the table, but most of the time you're gonna to wanna to throw out that animal companion, given that you're gonna get a four four Misha uh, for three mana, which is broadly, in terms of impact, better, just because you're not entirely guaranteed that you're gonna have the empty hand for this to take effect. And of course, then you also have Leok, which buffs your minions, very valuable, and then also Huffer, who charges in as the boar to do a bit more damage. So a nice little combo of those three. Of course, you can also drop something like a Web Spinner, um, some of the one uh, mana hunter cards that are quite handy, maybe a tracking timber or things like that, depending on your deck. So uh, the four point in a hunter deck, um, and of course, you can see in my list there on the right, Piloted Shredder. So there are some nice four drops that Core Rager may not necessarily immediately replace, but it's a beast. Um, it will very, very nicely um, drop down and charge in. Uh, it could be kind of comboed as well, uh, as mentioned by Ember in chat with Tundra Rhino. If we pick up the Tundra, you'll be subcharge. If I threw it on Tundra Rhino, and that has been teched in some more mid-range hunters, a uh, four charging Core Rager is not bad whatsoever. Of course, you'd probably also be looking at that point in the game if you drop a Tundra Rhino to be trying to move into the wonderful Savannah High Main, which is just oh so strong, oh so nasty. So, Core Rager at worst is a 4 4 4. You can use it in a pressure deck, in a rush deck, potentially as a finisher, but there are some very nice dragons which you might rather drop in. It's also a trigger, of course. You can use it for the beast part if you really need for a kill command. At the time that you drop it in the game, if you've got an empty hand, a 7 7 is amazing. It is going to make it big game hunter worthy, but if you're playing a mid to late range hunter, it gets rid of that big game hunter and will let you play your Boom or Ragnaros or something with a bit more freedom. And of course my list on the right is more, um, it, it pressures, but it's a little bit more mid range, I'd say, mid kind of winny type tech. So Call Rager, decent card. If you get the situational bit to trigger, then you're going to have a really good time with that 7-7. Seven, seven. You can either beta core, uh, you can bait a big game hunter out, or you'll be able to do some nice pressure with that card. Certainly, your opponent will have to remove it and use control on it before it gets removed. So, at the moment, it doesn't look like a universal pick, but certainly quite a strong card, and an arena will be awesome. Quick shot, this is pretty much. Um, so, in terms of quick shot, I'd probably go for. This is a dark bomb. It's two mana, three damage. And again, you can see the situational, if your hand is empty, trying to encourage a hunter to mill through their hand quickly. So it's kind of interesting that both of these are encouraging you to have an empty hand to get a benefit. The, only, the easiest way to get an early hand in the early to mid game, of course, is to have cheap cards that you can play quickly. And what kind of hunter deck has cheap cards that you can play quickly? Oh, it's all of the rush hunters, so it's kind of feeding that kind of early game pressury, potentially archetype. How do you empty your hand as quickly as possible to get all of these wonderful benefits that the new hunter cards may give you? And hey, you know what? At the very worst, quick shot, deal three, control a minion for two mana, gives hunters a bit of survivability in the early game if they are playing a more mid range or late range kind of option. At best, you get a free card draw as well. Nothing wrong with that. Pretty solid. Probably see a bit more play, I think, in mid game to sort of more tempo-y hunters. In a rush hunter deck, you're using your minions more, uh, generally speaking, to get through things. This is if you want to pick off a key enemy minion in the early game. You're probably going face, 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 face. But it's also a direct damage spell, deal three damage. You can do it to your enemy hero as well for a bit of extra burst if you really, really need. So quick shots could be used to help top up a bit of burst damage in that sense as well. Okay, we're going to have a look at the legendaries now. Just quickly drop out of the class cards for a little bit. And with Hunter, we have Cro-Magus. Cro right, Cro-Magus looks pretty harsh. After you draw a card, or whenever you draw a card, put another copy into your hand. Cro-Magus, where could we use Cro-Magus? Right, for 6 attack and 8 health, he will stick around a reasonable amount. 
He's underneath Big Game Hunter, which is good. Um, your opponent's going to have to use some other removal. But priests with Shadow of Death, warriors will have their usual execute shenanigans and tricks. There are plenty of ways that Cremagus can still get taken out. The health pool is significant enough to sit around for a little while. Now, getting a double of every card is kind of cool. Until you think about the kind of decks where this may or may not work in. What you really want is to be drawing lots of cards that you can play on multiple copies of um, at the stage in the game where you're at. Now, Chromagus, unless you ramp him, is not coming out to the late game. So by the late game, your deck is already thinned down. You would have probably already played a bunch of cheaper cards if you only get him on turn 8. Let's say even turn 7 with the coin. So what is Chromagus going to do? He's going to double up everything else that you've got left in your deck. Now, if your deck has been flowing through and you haven't had card blockages or problems, you're probably going to be stuck with more expensive cards that are harder for you to put down on multiples in a turn. And what this does, of course, is it's going to fill up your hand very quick. And if you can't play those cards that Chromagus is duplicating, um, you very quickly might find yourself in a situation where you're shredding cards, cards are being drawn off the top of your deck and burnt because you've already got a full hand of 10 and there's nothing you can do. So Chromagus is a double-edged sword. He is good but you need to think, how can I get him out earlier so that I can take more advantage of his spell, with uh, with his of his power, with cards that I can play multiples of ideally in the same turn? Or how can I pay, or do I have a deck which revolves around a lot of cheap cards that when I do draw doubles, they're going to be very easy for me to play? Because what Chromagus is effectively giving you is a massive card advantage, and you need to use that card advantage to get ahead of your opponent or finish them off. If your deck is not revolved around using that power in that kind of way when you get out Chromagus, then you're doubling cards for the sake of doubling cards, and it may actually do you more harm than good. So there are interesting things. Can I, how can I get Chromagus out earlier? Well, he could drop into Druids. He's an obvious ramp target. If I play him on turn 6 um, with an Innovate, then that's going to be helping me earlier in the game, drawing more cards so I can potentially play more early and better. So an obvious example. Um, other different things. Here's a dragon. There are cards that help dragons get out more quickly. We'll show you those soon. And then another thing that we were thinking of was, well, not only how can I play more early, but how can I fit him into a deck that revolves or has a lot of cheap uh, cards that I can do a lot of good damage with. So Chromagus, for example, um, how about taking him into sort of a mage spell deck? Double Frostbolts, double Fireballs. These are spells that you will always be happy to cast on, cast on a turn, pretty much, and will always have some utility. Double Polymorph. Lots of interesting things you can do there. Any sort of deck which throws around a bunch of spells. Or you can take a look at things that have a bunch of cheap minions. So another different option could be, let's go crazy and say a Shaman with Neptune on, um, or a Murloc Shaman something like that. You can even throw Chromagus as a late game finisher into say a rush deck even, something to give you a bit of late game range. You drop Chromagus in the mid to late game if your game runs that long and what it will let you do is start grabbing more cards and instead of running out of steam because generally in a rush deck you run out of cards, run out of steam. It will let you keep refueling, keep going and keep going and keep going. Chromagus perhaps with a handlock draw multiple giants. What happens if you're uh, uh, drawing sort of, you know, multiple molten giants when your health is low and you can just drop giant, giant, giant. It's the kind of mage giants um, duplicate sort of theory uh, or mirror entity kind of theory where you can just do that but with a, a hand lock maybe. So there's interesting things. Where are you going to be able to either draw cards that you can play nice and fast? Can you get Chromegus out earlier? Or can you find a way perhaps of allowing him to generate cards that are just sort of so easy to play or that will really swing the game for you. So really interesting card. Um, not situationally awesome but I think he's going to be teched in. People will try and build decks around Chromagus or see like we've just discussed how he can add a little bit to existing decks. Major Domo Executus. I like the look of Major Domo. He's, uh, he's fun. So 997, he's a big game hunter, fat target. He's late game at night mana. He's not going to be... You can throw him in late game decks. He's not going to be an all-conquering hero that wins it on your own. Now, Death Rattle is fun. Replace your hero with Ragnaros. Ragnaros has a two-mana power called Die Insect, and that does eight damage to a random enemy, just like playing an eight-eight eight Ragnaros card. So Ragnaros has eight health. Your armor, I think it's been confirmed, actually gets removed when Ragnaros gets played. So for that reason, 
you don't really want to be. He almost does a, a health reduction. Too soon, Executus. Too soon. For that reason, he's kind of taking your health down as opposed to saying an extra as a play that builds your health back up. You can, of course, I think, it needs to be confirmed, I think you can armour him up afterwards. So there might be options. His hero power is awesome, but if you're on 8 health, you're pretty vulnerable to being killed. So as soon as you drop Major Domo, you should be dropping Major Domo as a real finisher where your opponent's going to know that if they kill it, you become Ragnaros. And hopefully they can't do that 8 damage to you. So Major Domo could go into some late game decks, could be fun if you ramp him out early. Ragnaros' power is awesome. Remember, of course, if you've only got 8 health, you need tanks, you need armor, you need protection, you need all kinds of things that are going to keep you alive so you can press the Ragnaros 8 damage I win button a few times. Otherwise, it's going to be a little bit tougher. So, interesting card. We'll certainly be playing some fun decks for sure. How much it will pervade into late game decks, he's, he can be ramped, or he could be used as an all out finisher. Um, but there are stronger, more reliable finishes out there that don't have the downside of the health and armor shenanigans that are going on. Rend Black Hand, if we're going into Black Rock. I'm going to say Black Rock Spy. Check my memory. Battle Cry for holding a dragon, destroy legendary. Eight attack, four health. Well, very powerful, strong ability to destroy legendary. But for four health, this card's probably going to get killed after it gets dropped, pretty much. It will get targeted, traded, removed, there's plenty of stuff that can do 4 damage at the stage in the game that you'll throw down rend. Uh, if you're holding a dragon, destroy a legendary, well if you have a dragon deck, destroying a legendary and playing rend is a good tempo swing. Think of the black knight. The black knight you get a reasonable minion and you get to destroy a tank. So not only do you get to play a minion but you get to destroy a tank. Rend gives you a similar tempo swing. It's one of those cards. So if I'm holding a dragon, if I'm playing a dragon deck, I need to build rend into a dragon deck of course. Uh, destroy a legendary then destroying a legendary in the late game when render's going to hit the table or even the mid game could make the difference what could I destroy? I could destroy things like Cairns or Banes I could destroy nasty things Ragnaros, Ragnarai you name the legendary, Rend can take it out if there's a dragon in hand so if the meta game has got a bunch of legendaries running around which generally it always does and you're playing Rend in a dragon deck or a deck that has access to late game and is going to have enough dragons in to make a difference then he is mana efficient and good control so it's think of a black knight the black knight is a bit more useful because a lot of people run taunts a lot of people do run legendaries but taunts can be dropped at various stages of the game and rend is dropping stuff in the late game so you can only turn up in the late game anyway so has some use see him in dragons Dragon's Breath for the Mages. This is continuing the mechanic that we were talking about of costing less for each minion that's died on this particular turn. Deal 4, cost 1 less. Well, if I flame strike and kill a bunch of stuff, then I might get a 4 nuke. Remember, of course, the mana efficiency of other mage cards. Um, Umbra makes a good point. The only way I see Ren being good is if you had the Health Swap. Yep, you could uh, do a, a Mad Alchemist. You could do the Crazed Alchemist and swap him from 8 4 to 4 8. He would certainly stick around for a while then. But his removal in itself is powerful. 7 mana to remove a legendary is slightly expensive, of course, on the removal side. But if it fits in with your theme and there's a way of keeping Ren alive, it's not only a big attacking threat that your opponents need to remove, but in a late game situation, it removes the legendary as well. So it's not all bad. But it just really depends on whether Ren can stay alive and whether you're running enough dragons to make him worthwhile. You have to be a late game deck for Ren to even sort of see play, unless you ramp into him with Druid and Dragons or something funky like that. Um, dragon's Breath, if I Flame Strike, if I trade minions like we are talking about with the other cards, then there's a way to get out some Dragon's Breath. So that's our tool for Magi. Uh, trade minions. Nerf stuff off the table, then you get a free 4 nuke. Now remember of course for uh, Flamethrower, that's 1 mana for 4 damage, which is evil. So mana efficiency wise, you can make this more mana efficient, but it is situational. Control and later game mage decks, this could be a tool in their armory after a flame strike. Uh, to do a bit of nuking, it is burn, in that you can certainly throw down some finishing spells. The mage decks which are uh, revolving around cold uh, and freeze, the late game control freeze mages 
and there's still a very new key late game control mage decks. Main like a Dragon's Breath as an additional finishing option. It's a way of getting in some uh, table control after clearing the table. So those decks that use Cone of Cold, Frost Nova, Flame Strike to clear the board on turn 7. This lets me get in another 4 damage nuke on something of my choice before I start going into my Frostbolt, Fireball, Fireball, Frostbolt, etc. And that big late game control mage nuking finish. Flame Waker, a nice little option for the uh, bands of Knife Juggler out there. Mages get a mini Knife Juggler, as I like to kind of call this guy. Two attack and four health that will survive for a bit. Pretty nice. However, after you cast a spell, also dealing that two damage randomly splitting among a few different enemies, will give you the option of picking off a few things. Think cheap mage spells, uh, the mage... Uh, decks which there's been tempo mages sort of which have been turning up recently and they are more happy to use the mana worm flamethrowers and all of the early game spells even arcane missiles things that let you cast cheap spells and buff up those mana worms of course so flame weaker doesn't work too badly in that early game mage option it's another way of potentially with a two attack and four health body he can trade a little bit against rushing minions and the additional chip damage after you casting spells should mean that spells plus chip damage plus the body of Flame Waker on the table for health should mean he should survive a couple of trades. Additional survivability for Mage in the early game. Uh, Mech Mage, yes, absolutely, and also spare parts. If you have a think of spare parts from throwing around ones and this is throwing two damages out everywhere, then that's pretty nice. And I'm pretty sure that'll grab some spell damage as well. So could work in a uh, Mech Mage, but it's what you're going to remove to grab him in. You're certainly not going to remove any of your early game mechs, I would think. Okay, some neutrals for us to have a look now before jumping off. We're going in alphabetical order, so we're going to have a bunch of neutral cards, um, followed by remaining class cards, I do believe. That'll be good. So let's think about dragons. Let's talk about dragons. Blackwing tech, if you're holding a dragon, gain 1-1. One, one. Now remember we have already taken a little look at uh, other dragony options such as uh, um, Chromegus, we've already seen, of course, uh, Rend who can destroy a legendary if you're holding a dragon. So, if you're holding a dragon X, dragon coming together like Mech came together as a family in Black Rock Mountain. So, this becomes a 3 5 for 3 mana if you're holding a dragon. That makes it a good target against early game aggro. You can use it to trade. You can also use it as a Sunfruit Protector Defender of Argus tank. So this offers early to mid game stability and trading and survivability if you're running dragons as a theme in your deck. Like it, a 2 4 is not bad for 3 mana. A 3 5 is very, very solid indeed for that cost. So you want to be holding a dragon, throwing this down, using it as a tank or using it to trade minions ideally. 3 attack, 2 attack is not going to break the bank, but the heavy health pool for this stage in the game makes it good value. Think of the Tinkertown Technician, the uh, card that becomes 4 4 if you have a mech on the table. Um, I do believe it's it. oh, a mech on the table or holding a mech. I should be able to remember that. I've played a bunch of that. Let's have a look at the Tinkertown tech quickly. Tinkertown Technician. TTT. Tinkertown tech's actually 4 mana. TTTTT. Have I forgotten the name of Tinkertown Technician? I kind of have. Tinkertown Tech Rogue, what's going on? Uh, it's because I've chosen the format. There you go, the Tinkertown Tech. Uh, if you have a mech, gain 1 1 and a spare part to your hand. So you get a similar benefit with the Black Ring Tech. Solid um, as a 3 5 rather than the 4 4 that the Tinkertown Tech would be. It will let you certainly grab and perhaps hold some table control. Black Ring Corruptor, if you're holding a dragon, so you want to be holding dragons, this is the theme. If you're holding a dragon, um, deal three. Now that deal three is of course to enemy hero or to minions as you see fit which is never a bad thing. So for that doing a little bit of zappy type damage. Hey a big welcome Vlad, good to have you with us. Being able to target stuff is pretty awesome. Now of course the health a little bit low but for five mana five attack gives you some ability to pressure as well. So this is, I broadly say speaking, okay. Blackwing Tech will help you trade in the earlier game. This is probably removable at turn five. Dealing the three, letting you pick off a minion and then having a threat, that's kind of trying to create that additional tempo swing that we were talking about earlier. 
Dragon Egg looks a little early game pushy rushy. Whenever this minion takes damage, summon a 2 1 whelp. So it's kind of like a Clyde Pain, Armor Smith, anything where you want it to take more single damage so you can spawn more individual minions. Dragon Egg and a Whirlwind, I see this going nicely with the Warrior. Dragon Egg and a Death's Bite, anything that lets you summon lots of whelps. You want to try and overwhelm your opponent with stuff. Uh, I think you can see Warrior decks with the Grim Patron Dragon Egg in. I think you can see Imp decks, uh, Warlock Imp decks that will start trying to take advantage of Dragon Egg as well. And perhaps even Priest. How can I buff my Dragon Egg's health so it can take more damage? Um, so you can summon more whelps so you can do more stuff. That would be pretty awesome. Dragon Egg, early game. It's fun you can have there, but how can you get its health higher? How can you individually damage it to do more stuff? You can certainly see it as an early game pressuring option. And remember, look, that's not actually a dragon there. So the whelps in the early game will give you more swarm ability, certainly. If there's a way that you can start hurting yourself or trading against your opponent, how can you buff it so that it takes damage? Uh, think of things like the Shattered uh, Sun Cleric, like various other buffs, perhaps in Shaman with totems. You can throw down a, a flame tongue totem to allow dragon eggs to start attacking, otherwise you need to be able to damage those yourself. Dragon King Sorcerer, whenever you target this minion with a spell gain 1-1, one, one. Um, 3 attack and 5 health for 4 mana, okay, but if you can throw small spells on it, I can see this going into Priest decks, I can also see it um, going potentially into Mage and Spare Party decks, and then finally Paladin 1 mana spells, of course there are a bunch of those. So this for being an innocent 3 attack 5 health minion could slot quite nicely into a few different decks. So if we go and take a quick look at Pally, I think that would be quite interesting to go and observe. Let's pull up the Paladin cards and see what our options are. Now look at all of the lovely one things we can cast. Give a minion 3 attack, blessing of wisdom, hand of protection, or a bunch of quite unusual cards, but when you suddenly start buffing up one of those cards, it could become quite nasty. Indeed, there are some other one mana things that you can throw around as well. The primary thing though is spare parts, so comboing it with mages potentially, comboing it with anything that generates you spare parts could make Dragonkin Sorcerer pretty nice, and of course Priests have got a nice buff too. Uh, Velen's Chosen says Umbra, yes that is, I think Velen's Chosen is ridiculous, Priests are having so much fun with that card. It's not broken the game, but it's certainly so strong in Priest card. Give minion plus two plus four, and spell damage at plus one. Uh, yes, that then gives you a 6, um, 10 Dragon King Sorcerer with spell damage plus 1. K Dragon King Sorcerer could go into a really nice priest style plays. Okie dokie. Draconid Crusher. Finish on this health game 3 3. If I'm playing a rush deck and my opponent's low, I can throw this in as a finisher. It can be another target that can grab Big Game Hunter. Well, this fit in. You can play it after Alex Straza and it for six mana, really mana efficient. Control Warriors could try use it as a finisher. Anything dragony with an Alex Straza that would want to use it as a finisher, I think it could fit in quite nice. Uh, Rush Hunters, Warlocks, anything that's trying to get your opponent's health so low so fast. Dropping a Draconic Crush, you can generally get your opponent's health to 15 by that time. And then you're baiting out their big game Hunter or trying to make them find some other control to prevent it. So I can see it in late game as a finisher. I can see it in early to mid game decks uh, as a potential drop but if you've got dragons dragon crusher certainly a good option grim patron whenever this minion survives damage summon another grim patron well this is swarmy five mana expensive for its stats how can i damage and it's very easy to quickly fill your board now i had another interesting option for this what you obviously want to do you want to be able to charge it in you want to be able to do damage you want to be able to do some pressure you want to be able to make sure that you can trigger and fill your board with Grim Patrons around 10, 5 and 6 as soon as possible. How can you do that? You may want to play things like the Unstable Ghoul that does 1 damage to all minions. The Explosive Sheep that does 2 damage to all minions. Whenever this minion survives damage, summon another Grim Patron. But you ideally want a couple of goes in a row where you can get multiple Grim Patrons out on the board and fill your board with Grim Patrons. So when you play the first one, you want to damage it. Then you want to be able to damage your other Grim Patrons to summon more Grim Patrons, and then find a way of healing them all back up. Or 
options. Well, there are things that you can actually play Priest Grim Patron. Circle of Healing will very quickly heal up all of your Grim Patrons that have taken damage. Warrior with Whirlwind and Despite will do a good job on Grim Patron as well. So the other thing you could look at is can you drop it into a Druid and then fill your board with Grim Patrons before going for a Savage Roar. Give all of the Grim Patrons plus three attack. You can put some very nasty pressure down indeed. Hungry, hungry dragon. Summon a random one cost. Providing you can deal with the one cost, you get a four attack, uh, four mana, five six, which is a really strong drop. Bouncing blades, says Dan. Welcome, Dan. Bouncing blades can do some eel. Indeed. Very, very nice. Indeed. Like a bit of that. So the hungry dragon. Um, we take a quick look at one costs. I'm just going to pan out so we can have a look at one cost minions. What? Random one cost, and of course, random one cost could be anything from any of the heroes. So there are awkward one cost minions. I'm not going to lie about that. Zombie Chow, well, that'll probably help me. North Star clerics and shadow bombers certainly help your opponent out there. Dust devils, flame imps, and void walkers, war bots, all kinds, and then of course our good old neutrals, which vary from very very useful to incredibly terrible. <laughs> A secret keeper when I have no secrets. Sorry for that. So, the random one cost can be dealt with, I feel. However, where would you drop this in? Dragon deck. It's more of a dragon deck because for full mana, if you're playing a full on rush deck, there are other things that are neutral that you might want to drop in there, I would say. So, this is not bad. I would probably look at it in terms of if I'm playing a dragon kind of option. Hungry dragon and mind control tech. Yeah, why not? Very, very awesome indeed. So you can use that for some early to mid game pressure. It's a good card for its stats and it providing you can deal with the one drop. It's really just a question of if you're going for an early to mid game dragon pressure deck. There are, again, there are also cards that can ramp out dragons so it could help fill your board in the mid to mid late game as well. Righty, we then have Nefarian. Nefarian, I'm a bit... Okay, you get the, the random shock and awe factor. Where can the foreign go? Well, look, late game decks, if you can ramp them out earlier. In a paladin deck that ramps dragons, and we have a look at the paladin ramp cards. Two random spells to your hand from your opponent's class. You could get, if I'm playing a mage, I could get two pyroblasts, or I could get two arcane missiles, or a pyroblast and an arcane missile. Any combo of any spell that the opposition class has. You can grab. The Fire Enemy himself is not bad, and of course you can get dragons out a little bit more early with the, the Dragon Consort, which we'll have a look at in a little bit. But the main thing with him is he's decent, but spell-wise it's just a question of can you actually get something that's going to be helpful or is your opponent just going to be scared of what you grab? We should see... Volcanic Drake costs one less for each minion that died this turn. It's the dragon that does so. So, looking at this, it's not actually bad in terms of being a splashable neutral. If I'm a hunter and I unleash the hounds through end Volcanic Drake, I might be able to drop a couple of those for little to nothing. And then its lower uh, health value for its mana cost and attack is not so significant if you can pay it pretty cheap. In terms of other bits and bobs. Well, if I'm playing Paladin and I have Muster for Battle, I sacrifice all my little peons or something like that, and then I can then throw down the Drake. Really, it's anything where you trade with minions or slay a bunch of your enemies in one go. And don't forget, of course, things like Flame Strike. You could throw it down after a Flame Strike for next to nothing, but ideally you're wiping out many minions or trading many existing minions to get yourself in a good table position. So. Not bad if you can set up a cheaper mana cost, and of course you can ramp it with the Paladin card as well. This is the card that I keep talking about. Dragon Consort is going to make everybody try Paladin Dragons. The, the decks are already going up on Hearthpool. And other sites, beg pardon, of your choice. The next dragon you play costs two less. Simple. Run two Dragon Consorts. It's a solid 555 minion. And I could play a Ysthera if this doesn't get silenced. I could play all kinds of stuff. Nefarian, Chromagus, you name it, we can throw it down. We can do some nice damage with it. So, ramping dragons in, more dragons more quickly is more painful indeed. 
not enjoying the thoughts or the looks of that. So keep an eye out for Dragon Consort, keep an eye as to how it's going to combo with dragons a whole bunch. Decks where you can get dragons in more quickly will certainly benefit this. And we're going to see people comboing mid-range pally with other bits and bobs to try and force a dragon line in there. It's already happening. Let's have a look at the dragon options we have right now. Twilight Drakes, Alexstrasza, Malagos, Ysera. I can drop any of those on turn 7. <laughs> if I uh, set them up perhaps with a turn 6 or a turn 5 dragon consort and don't play another dragon. If you take a look at all the new dragons that we have, we have Chromegus. We have the splendid and the neutral dragons that we've already flagged. We also have Nefaria and so on and so forth. I'm pretty sure you can see how cheaper dragons more early is going to be nice. Um, it is a put into instant effects. It's an instant effect and I believe the effect survives. Um, that's a good question. If you silence it, the next dragon you play costs over. I don't know, because it's a battle cry, the effect takes effect when you play the card. Therefore I don't think a silence is going to affect it. Obviously, because the effect has already taken place, so um, just have to double check that. But I think that's how it would work. It's an effect that stays valid on you until you play a dragon, and there's nothing after it's been played that your opponent can do to prevent it, as far as I would assume or know. So, Dragon Consort, powerful. We expect it to be comboed with those bad boys that you can see behind us, plus a lot of the new dragons, including the legendaries that are turning up. Indeedy. Solemn Vigil, draw two cards, cost one less for each minion that died this turn. The other Paladin card. Again, you've got Divine Favour in Paladins at the moment. And what Divine Favour, of course, lets you do is draw cards until you have as many cards as your opponent has in their hand. Divine Favour is cheap. It is not hugely... It's as reliable as the deck you're playing against and how your opponent is going. So, Solemn Vigil costs a bit more, less if you can sacrifice minions, but gives you the guaranteed two. And remember, Lay on Hands for eight mana, restores eight health and draws a bunch of cards as well. So, what it gives Paladin is another card draw option that is probably pitched a bit more, I would say, mid-gaming. Uh, you generally tend to use your um, Divine Favours in the mid to late game. You generally t have to use, of course, Lay on Hands in the late game itself. You have an option here with this 5 mana cost, it is expensive if you use it without suicides or without minion trades or killing enemy minions, but if you're able to pull Solemn Vigil into play um, in the earlier game by trading minions, then it can either give you, um, at worst it gives you a mid game to late game guaranteed card draw, at best if you could make some really good trades it gives you free card draw or an earlier game card draw option you might be able to access normally for a reasonable, uh, reasonably sort of solid mana cost. If you can make those trades. So is it going to be a Paladin Essential? No, I wouldn't say so, depending on the meta. But remember that Paladin, of course, has access to things like Consecrate. So Paladin has already got some good card draw options. This gives them another one that could situationally, depending on the meta game and how many waves of minions you're going to be slaying. Don't forget, if people are throwing out loads of Twilight Whelps and things like that, in coupling with all of the Imps and with all of the Hounds and all of the charging cards that really exist, if you're going to be killing swarms and swarms of little minions, then suddenly Solemn Vigil and all of these cost less for each minion that died this turn is going to be pretty evil. So metagame pending, if you're clearing ways of minions, Solemn Vigil is awesome. Priest time. Resurrect, summon a random friendly minion that died this game. Priests, I think, are going to pack these. Anyway, the, the standard control priest that exists right now has great value minions. You're dropping things like Dark Cultists. You're dropping other bits and bobs that can cause so many problems. Sludge Belchers in the mid game if you're going to be really, really going for um, different bits and bobs, you can pull out some really nasty minions. So, Resurrect, a random friendly minion that died this game, if you control what you kill before you play Resurrect, then if the first minion that dies for me, if I'm lucky, is a, I don't know, Sludge Belcher, I get a Sludge Belcher for two mana. If I even summon a Dark Cultist straight onto the table for two mana, that's good. Um, but the more minions that die, of course, then 
the more random it is to what you're going to receive. If you had 10 minions die, you're more likely to get something that is perhaps not so useful. But generally speaking, you should be able to, if a priest is packing valuable and useful minions, get at least two mana's worth of value out of that, if not more. How this will help, potentially could help you surviving early to mid-game pressure, or in the mid to late game, if you're throwing it down, could help you perhaps even get a tempo turn. So resurrect, very strong indeed. Twilight Whelp is another priest card. This is our early game style priestly Twilight Hatchling. Sorry, no, it's called Twilight Whelp. They're holding a dragon game two. That then makes it a uh, zombie chow without the downside for one mana. Brilliant. You're playing priest dragons, I think dragon priest along with dragon paladin. are going to be two decks that people try and build. And this is a perfect way to start off. You're not going to give your opponent health. You can attack minions, you can make trades. It's a dragon which can help you with other dragon start effects as well. We'll see playing Priest Dragon decks, certainly. Do Shadow Madness to minions you've killed go into the minion pool for Resurrect? That's a great question. should ask the Hearthstone guys that on Twitter. I'll have to have a look around and see if there's an answer for that somewhere. That's a really, really good question. Uh, we'll have to see. I'll see if I can think of some examples. Dark and Skulker, Battlecraft dealing 2 damage to undamaged enemy minions is kind of like a backstab on steroids, uh, which is nice indeed. Hey, if you're playing an aggro deck, Dark and Skulker can bring things back for you. If you're running into preparation into it, it gives rogues a way of surviving swaths of early game minions. It can soften up a lot of other minions for perhaps something like a um, Eviscerate or something similar. So the Skulker, nice for controlling table, softening up minions, a way of getting back against aggro, certainly. I'm not a huge rogue player, I'll be honest, so in terms of thinking of some other uses for him, I need to go back and have a bit more of a think about Dark Hunt, how Dark Hunt Skulker could work with rogue. Spell damage with him as well could be doing some very, very nasty pressure if you're throwing him down against um, other cards and you have spell damage in play. I really like Gang Up though, this is going to be a big rogue card, choose a minion, shuffle three into your deck. Now choosing a minion, you can choose an enemy minion I believe on the table, one of your own minions, because choose any minion that is I presume in play, because you'll have to do a selecting effect with it. Three copies into your uh, Consecrate and a one mana 4-3 as rogue, doesn't damage minions, only kills, it bursts. Um, yeah, I get what you're saying there. Um, for Gang Up, I'll shuffle three copies of it in. You're not going to get an immediate bonus, but for two mana you're getting great later game value. So when you're playing things like Rogues, which are chewing through their cards and using Sprint, Sprint and all that kind of stuff to really quickly grab cards together. Rogues have gone for Sprint a lot more rather than using the card draw of uh, the old Gadgets and Auctioneer that used to be a big part of Miracle Rogue. So being able to shuffle three copies in, if I shuffle in three Belchers, three Leroy's, three of something nasty that my opponent has, it gives me really nasty options for finishing a game off. Or if I'm about to lose a minion that I've not got value from, it lets me re-get more value. So SI7 Agents are the example that everyone seems to be taking a look at. Supposing I as a rogue can pull out, um, shuffle three SI7s into my deck, and then I can just be throwing SI7 Agents all around the place. Combo deal to damage, combo deal to damage, combo detail damage. Add on some spell damage on the table. If I can play cheaper SI7 agents, that's going to be really nasty indeedy. So, expect to find some uses for gang up. Three Leroy's if you fancy. Three cards of a charge for a bit of a finish. Maybe three cold bloods, that could be very nasty indeed. Giving minions more attack. Fire Guard Destroyer. We'll see play in mid and late range shamans. Shamans have got more access to the late game. They don't have to tempo or mid range or rush so much anymore. Fire Guard gives you a water elemental statted minion on turn 4 with a battle cry that could make it between anything from a 4-6 to a 7-6. If it's a 7-6 and your opponent big game hunters it, then they've used up a big game hunter or some control. If it's below that, then your opponent still controls it. If not, you've got a very strong minion in the early game that you can use to start making trades as a shaman. You can get ahead of the curve before all of the nasty five drops fall. Fire Guard Destroyer will certainly see play. Pretty simple and straightforward cards. You can combo, of course, with Lava Shock to see if you can get rid of that overload. Make sure you don't keep yourself locked up on turn five. 
Lava Shock, deal two, and unlock your overloaded mana crystals. So if I play this and overload myself by one for next turn, perhaps if I coin into it, if I play both of these on turn six, I'm going to unlock that crystal for use next turn. If I've overloaded by three or two, it unlocks all overloaded mana crystals. Not just one, not just two, but all. So if I've overloaded myself drastically and can Lava Shock after, it will unlock them for this turn. It will unlock them this turn if I need to play them, or it will unlock them next turn if I don't, I'm not able to use them this turn. So as far as I know, Lava Shock works on both your turn or your next turn, depending on how you're actually using it and when you're overlocked, uh, and when you're overloaded, of course. So Lava Shock, strong for chamois. We will see play, particularly in mid to late game decks and things that are pretty uh, good at using a bunch of overloads. Will really, really help shamans smooth out their mana curve and pressure. So let's take a look at things. There's a, a Shaman uh, Earth Elemental deck that revolves around throwing out Earth Elementals and also things like uh, Shaman sort of Rebirth. So hey, if I play a turn five Earth Elemental if I, and then the next turn I could throw down a Lava Shock and then use the rest of my mana, that's going to help a bunch. I'll throw down an Earth Elemental on turn seven and throw down a Lava Shock and still have a full turn eight. There are loads of nice combos where you can get around those heavy overloads and smooth out your mana curve as a chamois. Fan of Lava Shock. Definitely see some play, as far as I can see. Demon Wrath. What if I wanted to Hellfire but I did not want to hurt myself in the face? Demon Wrath is for you. If I'm running a Demon Lock, it also means that I can AoE my opponent without hurting my own minions. It will see play in Demon Locks and potentially as some additional early game clearance um, for Warlocks who are looking to keep themselves alive against things like mechs and similar. If you're a demon lock, you may well run it almost instead of Hellfire. Remember, it doesn't damage your own hero as well. So, will be situational control for various Warlock decks. Yamgang Boss, if you're playing one of those Impy Zoos that play Sea Giant, well, what if you implosion your own Yamgang Boss? You can certainly fill your table with imps. Pretty nasty indeed. As a demon, it gets all of the demon buffs that show up. As well. Welcome Sim, good to have you with us. So, if you're playing Demon Lock, certainly an option. If you're playing one of those Impy Zoos, this is also an option. We'll see play in either Rushy Warlock decks who want to get even more Imps out even earlier, and potentially Demon Locks who would like a bit more table control. Throw down to see a giant afterwards and you're laughing. Axe Flinger for the Warriors. Warriors, we've already covered this a few times, but Enragey, weapony, aggressive warriors. One of this takes damage, goes well with Grim Patron, deal two damage to the enemy hero. The more damage you can do to Axe Flinger, like Armorsmith, like the Acolyte of Pain, the more two damage you're gonna get. So the best thing is that Axe Flinger takes damage five times and does ten damage to the enemy hero. Well that's brilliant. How can warriors do damage? Whirlwind, Revenge, the new card which I'll have a look at in a moment. Uh, the joys of um, Death Spite as well, the weapon that does the whirlwind effect. And we've also got Explosive Sheep. The Unstable Ghoul, I think, is really going to make a comeback. Unstable Ghoul kind of got ignored a bit for the Explosive Sheep for control, but being able to do less damage to all minions is going to be good in this expansion so, uh, with a few of these cards. So I think Unstable Ghoul is going to be pretty good. And the Unstable Ghoul is going to be so, so awesome. So Axe Flinger, how do we get most value out of him? Well, we can charge him into other people and control minions if we really want. I think Axe Flinger we're going to see in weapons based pirate aggressive early game warrior decks and ones within range. So I'll play a whole bunch of warrior myself. Let's have a look at what this could add to warrior. If we go and grab our nice sword there, well we've got whirlwind, we know how awesome that is. Doing one damage to a minion, giving it to attack, you can even attack with him if you really wanted. But what I'm really thinking about for warrior is comboing him with cards such as Cruel Taskmaster. Armorsmith, the usual Acolyte Bouncing Blade, was mentioned by Dan earlier, that could potentially help trigger a whole bunch of things uh, for Warrior, for Grim Patron. Anytime it survives damage, summon one. So Bouncing Blade on top of the Grim Patrons, loads of Grim Patrons, Bouncing Blade on top of a Axe Flinger. Loads of damage to your opponent's face. Could be very, very nice indeed. Can you heal up your Axe Flinger so it can take even more damage, that'd be awesome. I'm thinking about Frothing Berserkers for pressure as well, whenever a minion takes damage, you gain one attack. So you can see Bouncing Blade, Frothing Berserker, Axe Flinger, 
um, equipping weapons and charging in despite in whirlwind you've got a very nasty aggressive warrior deck throwing some core core elites for fun i think we'll see pressuring early game warriors early to mid game warriors becoming even nicer and nicer i think that was definitely be a, a, a renaissance sort of pressure warrior deck or a rushy deck with the advent of this new expansion okay we're almost there folks revenge our other warrior cards this is an expensive expensive option um, when it comes to uh, the one damage so it's not so good as whirlwind but if you've got 12 or less deal three now how this is cool is am I damaging am I clearing my opponent's table if I've been rushed down pretty cool can I damage all my minions to armor up with loads can I really wipe my opponent's minions off the map can I soften them up enough that as an aggressive warrior I can come in and do damage as a control warrior I'd probably not pick revenge unless I really needed it I might tech in one as a control late game warrior if I really got hurt in the early game or if I was really getting playing a lot of rush decks this could help um, I mean, you know but by the time I've got 12 health against something like a mech mage I'm probably dead if I'm being killed that much by turn 4 or turn 5 but it could help me really even the scores clear the table a bit so it could be a real clutch card when it comes to trying to grab back table control if I've been rushed down but ideally I'd want to be using this on a controlled sense when I get 12 or less health and then I can armour up I can put tanks or taunts in front of me and then I can use revenge to just be clearing out my opponent's minions but of course it does 3 to mine as well so it is a sort of very excessive whirlwind um, that if you can find a way of using it in a controlled fashion you're not just using it as a combat card it's still causing you a lot of pain uh, but again in the warrior decks we've mentioned if we're swinging with our warrior for wins um, with things like Arcanite Reaper and Gore Howl by the late game then revenge could help us clear the way we're going to be low on health as a weapons as an aggressive early game warrior so by that stage we could do some really really good bits and bobs and a big welcome to Dark Hujo. And no worries, lots of people um, come back. A um, little few bits from chat. Dan says, I envy your card collection. Well, I've been going at it for a while. What can I say? Uh, Vlad says, No worries if you haven't played Hearthstone for a while. Lots of people come back with the adventure modes. And a big welcome to Dark Kujo joining us live too. I'm just about to finish actually up for today, but uh, this will be live on YouTube very shortly. So revenge has uses as a warrior could tech it into a late game warrior. I think that with that aggressive early game weapons pirate style warrior, the uh, uh, enraging warrior that we've just discussed, have a think about how revenge could potentially be a, a way clearer, a way of clearing the way, getting rid of minions so that you can swim with your warrior for that final weapon blow as soon as you can. And there's one card that has decided not to pop up. It's perhaps one of the most interesting ones. So for us to finish on a high, I'm going to go and pick this one specifically. Now, this is a nasty card. I don't know if you can see that. I don't know if I need to re-trigger my screen region. I'll leave you with this. Now, a lot of the other cards, you've taken a look at Chrome Magus as a legend, and you thought, oh my god, that's... Yeah. Uh, my goodness, pardon me, that is potentially amazing. You take a look at Nefari and thought, right, I might have some use for that in the late game. But what about this... Emperor Thaurisian. This card delights me and scares me in equal measure as to what is it's going to be actually be able to do. At the end of your turn, reduce the cost of cards in your hand by one. If I leave that on the table for two turns, the cards in my hand have been reduced by. Yep. It may be basic maths, but how scary, how amazing could this card be? Now, the health is low. Of course, five for, for its health, it's all right. Uh, for its mana cost, it's not too bad. Um, reducing the cost of cards in your hand by one. If I've got cheap cards to start with, imagine if I've got Murlocs, it's just like amazing. Um, benefits more with cheaper cards or stuff you can 2x in one go, but yes, definitely agree. Scary. Um, like the new Lothar, but every deck says Dan, I agree, Dan, we sp it could, it's going to be quite, loads of people are going to try and use it, but let's let's refine it a little bit, so how does it help me most? At the time of the game it comes out, turn 6, turn 5 with a coin, what else is happening? My opponent's taking control of the board, I'm 
effectively not losing a go, but I'm not denying my opponent anything. It basically means I'm playing it instead of Lotheb to de deny those spells. And remember, Lotheb drops a turn earlier. I'm playing it so that I can very, very, I can then get a benefit next turn. So let's say I'm turn seven. If I've reduced the cost of cards in my hand by one, maybe I have two four costs, I can now play both of those four costs in one go. So we should take a look, broadly speaking, at what this can enable on turn seven, maybe turn six. If I have a coin, I can. Uh, uh, turn five, I can play a song with a coin, I can bring out turn six. Or, of course, if I'm a druid, I can innovate it out. If I'm a druid, then I innovate out a Thorician. Um, I think it reduces by one every turn it's on field. So yes, Vlad. Vlad says, does it go sequentially? It's all cards in your hand get reduced by one. And then if it lives another turn, all cards in your hand. So one, you want Thorician to live for a while. Yes, the one's in hand. So if I draw one, then that's not going to get cheaper by one until the end of the turn, of course. Um, which is nice. So Thorissian, let's just step back and let's have a little th uh, theory craft with Thorissian and think, right, how could he affect games? Firstly, let's take a look at neutral minions and have a look. I'm looking at things. Now, anything cheaper, let's have a look on, let's take a look at turn seven. So I'm really looking at things that I couldn't play two of on turn seven, but now I can. And also, if we take a look at the cheaper stuff first, it's things that I could potentially swarm with after turn seven. So after turn seven, things, let's take a look at four drops. Two chill when yetis for six mana. I play Emperor Thorissian, and then if I have two four drops in hand on turn seven, I can play two chill when yetis for six. I could play Baron Rivendare in a combo stuff, but I'm not sure Trogs could hit the table. Okay, Nullifiers, Defender of Argus, Starkind Dwarf, Kazan Mystic. Look at all of the strong four drops. Two piloted shredders. Nasty, very nasty indeed. Think of what you can now drop on turn seven as doubles for taking over the table. What Thorisian will let you do is let you start throwing out nasty, nasty. So, lots of nasty stuff you can pull in. Uh, people in chat saying, ah, nasty, nasty, nasty things that the Thorisian can do. Send in Shield Masters, but teacher, okay, maybe not two Violet Teachers, Twilight Drake. It can be good if you can kill them before they get a card like Brawl, uh, says Dark Cujo. Um, absolutely. So what Thorisian is going to do is unlock a big pressure situation in this mid-game. Uh, unless you're a druid. If I'm a druid and I can get Thorisian out even earlier and he's even harder to remove, then that would could unlock early to mid-game druid decks even more. So when we were taking a look at the new druid cards, we were saying, well, what druid kind of lacks is stuff in the early game. Druid gets another couple of early game options. It gets the druid of the flame that gives you a 2-5 or a 5-2 that triggers druid of the fang. Um, if I drop a Thorisian or can ramp into a Thorisian on turn four, let's say, or turn three, then as a druid I can start unlocking my mid-range cards. It not only gives druid more early game power, but really helps out a druid as mid-range because druid can get this out even earlier. So that would be most awesomes. So Thorissian, Druid-wise, we've already identified with Innovate, we can whip it out a little bit earlier. Hey, Brill, if I'm able to play all of the nasty Druid cards, plus let's take a look at our Ramp Druid. Thorissian, throw him straight into a Ramp. All of the big cards you want out with Ramp Druid, if you can ramp them even harder, if you can get a Thorissian out. I think Thorissian is a fun tech that we'll see showing up in Ramp at a minimum. If we take a look at those neutral minions, anything bigger than four, hey, well, what does it unlock on turn four? Eight on turn eight, I can play two five drops, and that means I can play all of this horror <laughs> and joy that you see before you. Two sludge belchers on turn eight, yes, I like that very much. Two spectrals, that could be pretty much a good game. Don't know how you're going to get two Leroy's down if you engineer the game for such. So, yes, we can see all of the nastiness and horror 
at any late game deck that is packing a Thorissian, any mid game deck can play more of the mid game cards more quickly to finish the game off, any late game deck can help ramp things in. And that is Thorissian himself. Now if we just take a little step back, I'll probably do a separate recorded video, we're going to finish up for this evening very very shortly, but if I take a look I'm just going to screen cap so we can take a look at the cards in themselves. Sorry for the windowsy type view. What other things can we can take away Blackrock Mountain wise? Well, we've seen that I would say number one, there are dragons are going to be tried to for, be fit into a lot of decks. We're going to see people try and drop dragons in. There's a strong core of dragon cards. If we remember, of course. Um, Paladins have got some interesting dragon options. Priests have also got dragon options. So Paladins, taking a look with at the Paladin a card, which is... I've just lost it. It's the pictures. If we take a look at Dragon Consort, then Dragon Consort is certainly going to be a strong drop. That's really going to help uh, Paladins ramp dragons out more quickly. All of the dragon cards have a, a fairly solid core. Priests have the advantage of the Twilight Hatchling there, which you can drop earlier if you have dragons. And don't forget, of course, the power of Thorissian, which can help not only dragons, but everything else hit the board a lot more quickly. Other things to look out for, Druids could perhaps have more early game options to mid-game options. Hunters have a couple of control options. Chromagus will help you draw double the cards, but depends what you want to get into. Domo is a finisher, a situational rend for a dragon deck in terms of legendary control. And as another secondary theme, to uh, the strength of dragons as a core. Think of how you can trade minions to get cheaper spells. That will be pretty interesting as well. If you can trade minions, if you can remove minions from the table, you can unlock power in dragon's breath. You can be doing interesting things with things like Solemn Vigil for Paladin. So, themes. Number one, dragons. How can you use them? Will they be in your deck? You'll certainly see them in other people's. Number two, Sacrificing and trading of minions and removing of minions to activate cheaper abilities is a thing in Blackrock Mountain. Number three, um, things such as how a shaman you can, if you're a shaman, how can you manage overload? Shaman's Fire Guard and Lava Shock allow meters to late game shamans. As a warlock, are you going to want to swarm with more imps? As a warrior, how can you maximize self damage to perhaps use Axe Flinger, Armor Smith, and things like Athelite of Paid and perhaps a stronger Rush Pirate Warrior deck or Weapons Warrior than has been used previously. As a priest, you've got interesting options with Revive. How can you make sure that you're sacrificing or killing minions to get really good mana value with that card? And then last but not least, have a think about Thorissian. We've just finished up with Thorissian. Thorissian is going to be something that a lot of people try to play to get more cards out more quickly. How can you use getting your entire hand cheaper by one mana every turn? And what are the best cards to try and combo with Thorissian and classes? Druid can ramp them out earlier. What other classes can use cheap spells and minions to make sure that Thorissian can either help you swarm the game as after he's played or really grab table control after he's played? Do you want to go with all cheap minions with Thorissian or do you want to go, as we were identifying, with minions that on turn 7, 8 uh, and 9 you can drop more of than you would be able to normally? On turn 8 you can drop 2 um, 5 drops now. Uh, if Thorissian survives, of course. Thorissian lives on turn 7, you're going to be able to drop uh, 2 4 drops for 6 mana when you couldn't before. So how can you use Thorissian? How can you keep him alive? He'll be an interesting card that a lot of people will try playing. So as broad trends, decks we'll see, we'll see Dragon Priests, we'll see some Shaman mid to late range decks, we'll see some Dragon Paladins most certainly, weapons based warriors, potentially more mid game druids, and then I think that the tools that mages have will help them take a look at more controlly mid to late game decks rather than the mech mage at this point in time. The neutral uh, Dragon Core will be very very awesome indeed. So. That's it for now. We're not going to do a specific class uh, breakdown, but thanks so much for tuning in. Um, if you're on YouTube, please come join us on stream, twitch.tv, forward We go live Monday through Friday. You can have a look in the uh, bottom left of the screen that we're putting back up now. You can see all of the times. We will tweet on at Felcraft on Twitter when we go live. And last but not least, the website, felcraft.org. 
Also, if you're on Twitch, youtube.com forward slash failcraftcast, please do throw us a sub there. If you can never make a stream, you'll always see um, the videos that we throw up afterwards. Some of them might be longer like this one, some of them are shorter, specifically edited videos, whether they're a direct cut of a stream or a shorter video. We just want to make sure you've got lots of stuff to watch if you fancy. So thanks very much for tuning in. Remember, Black Rock Mountain releases April 3rd in EU, April 2nd if you're in America. Um, it might be live late on the night of April the 2nd if we're in the EU. So that's Thursday, so not long to go for Black Rock. Um, do, if you're on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, let us know what we can do better. You can see links here to subscribe and to see our other videos too. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Hearthstone Half Hour. I've been Hammy and this is Felcraft. Take it easy.